So good evening, everyone. We have a number of announcements to get through, but I want to start with a few rumors. We are not planning any forced shelter-in-place orders. Everyone needs to get their news from legitimate places, not from their friends, 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 friend. Please check mass.gov slash COVID-19 for all updates. Our state and local health officials are monitoring this issue around the clock and working hard to provide new resources and support to our residents. I want to take a minute to go over what the science tells us about this disease. For the vast majority of people, approximately 80% of the population, coronavirus would mostly feel like the flu. The infection would not lead to hospitalization. Your body fights the infection and recovers. But the reason we're taking this so seriously is because it is incredibly contagious. It's more contagious than the seasonal flu. There will be more cases of COVID-19, but we also know that if we take decisive steps now and everyone plays their part by following the best medical guidance, we can slow down the spread. And our healthcare system can be better positioned to care for the people who need it. Tomorrow and Tuesday, only emergency executive branch workers will report in, plus those who are designated by their manager to be critical to our response to COVID-19. Managers will be notifying those employees tonight. During this period, we will work to expand alternative work arrangements for the executive branch workforce and further develop plans to continue to provide the essential government services people expect. We've been working around the clock on several provisions, emergency actions, and emergency actions to respond to COVID-19. Today, we are ordering all commercial health insurance carriers to allow providers to deliver services via telehealth. This allows people to avoid physically going anywhere should they need to consult a medical professional. Secretary Sutters will say more on this later. We will also be directing hospitals to postpone elective surgeries to ensure medical workers and hospital space is available. We will be prohibiting long-term care facilities and nursing homes from allowing any visitors and require hospitals to screen visitors and restrict visitation. The Registry of Motor Vehicles will extend the renewal timeline for certain credentials to reduce the need for customers to physically visit an RMV service center for in-person transactions. We will be relaxing some of the requirements around current unemployment claims. This will allow many of the workers who are affected by closures to get some financial relief faster. We will file emergency legislation that will allow new claims to be paid more quickly by waiving the one-week waiting period for unemployment benefits that currently exists under state law. We will also file emergency regulations expanding the eligibility around collecting unemployment for people who've been impacted by COVID-19. We will also file a legislative package to help address challenges surrounding the municipal governance issues that have been raised by many cities and towns, including potential delays in holding town meetings and adopting fiscal year 2021 municipal budgets. We announced last week that the Boston Marathon would be postponed until September 14, 2020, and we'll file legislation tomorrow to make that official. All of this will be filed tomorrow when the legislature is open. Most of you know that last week we issued guidance prohibiting large gatherings of 250 people or more. Today we're amending that guidance under our emergency powers to prohibit gatherings of over 25 people. Subject to this order, these gatherings include all community, civic, public, leisure, faith-based events, sporting events with spectators, concerts, conventions, and any similar event or activity that brings together 25 or more people in a single room or a single space at the same time. This includes venues like fitness centers, private clubs, and theaters. With respect to restaurants, I am ordering that any restaurant, bar, or establishment that offers food or drink shall not permit on-premises consumption. These establishments may continue to offer food for takeout and for delivery. 
establishments must also follow the social distancing protocols set forth in the Department of Public Health guidance. This order is effective Tuesday, March 17, 2020, and shall remain in effect through April 17, 2020. I want to be clear, this order doesn't apply to grocery stores or pharmacies. This is about bars and restaurants and those places that people do not absolutely have to go. I realize these measures are unprecedented, but we're asking our residents to take a deep breath and understand the rationale behind this guidance. As we said yesterday, grocery stores are getting restocked. The reason we're seeing bare shelves on the news and when we shop is because people are taking stocking up a little overboard. Just remember that if you buy two years of canned soup, that just means your neighbor may have to go without. For responsible planning advice, visit mass.gov slash no plan prepare. Now given the involving data regarding cases of COVID-19 and out of abundance of caution for the health and safety of children and school staff, I'm ordering a three week suspension of school operations for educational purposes at all public and private elementary and secondary schools. This will be effective starting this Tuesday and continues until April 7th. That means unless your district isn't already closed, school is on tomorrow, but not Tuesday. We understand that many districts rely on school buildings for essential services outside of educational programs, like meal programs and special education. Closing down school for classes will not impact these types of service, services, and we will work with school districts to keep buildings open whenever possible to continue to offer these services. Although schools must suspend in-person educational operations, staff should be planning for how to equitably provide alternative access to learning opportunities during this period and potentially beyond. Equally important, school personnel should develop plans for ensuring to the greatest extent possible that families have access to essential non-academic services for their children, especially involving special ed and food services for students who are the most vulnerable. As you know, many school districts have already announced they will suspend classes for a couple of weeks or more. It's important that we all take a couple of minutes to think about why dispersing classes and school gatherings is necessary to help us mitigate the spread of COVID-19. Our public health officials have made clear COVID-19 will feel like the flu for the vast majority of the people who get it, but it's highly contagious. By breaking up large gatherings and encouraging social distancing, we can prevent the spread. But we can't simply transfer a group full of kids from their classroom to your neighbor's playroom for days on end. We will not be doing our part to prevent the spread if there are a ton of kids hanging out, playing video games, and sharing snacks every day from one house to the next. We're urging parents and caretakers to use the next three weeks to truly practice social distancing. This means maintaining a safe separation of at least six feet from others. This means no free-for-all play dates and more time at home with only immediate family for the next three weeks. The Department of Elementary and Secondary Education will work in partnership with schools and districts to develop strategies to sustain learning and vital services throughout this period. DESE has already received a partial waiver from the U.S. Department of Agriculture providing greater flexibility regarding food service in certain districts with higher concentrations of low-income students and is actively pursuing additional waivers for the remaining schools and districts. The suspension of educational op operations at K-12 schools will inevitably affect the provision of preschool and childcare services. Although we are not ordering the closure of childcare programs at this time, we are strongly urging childcare providers to strictly observe guidelines that are being issued by the Department of Early Education and Care and the Department of Public Health, which call for temporary closures based on actual or indirect exposure to individuals with COVID-19. 
This order does not apply to residential schools for special needs students or other group homes. At the same time, EEC will prioritize the maintenance and expansion of childcare capacity serving frontline healthcare workers and first responders across the state. With regard to higher education, the Department of Higher Education and DPH strongly recommend that colleges and universities, both public and private, continue to pursue strategies to reduce the need for students to be on campus and shift to remote learning to allow students to successfully complete courses. Yesterday, as you may know, we also announced that we're standing up a coronavirus command center. This team of experts will work on pushing back against this disease and focus on expanding testing capacity and distribution and quickly responding to the needs of our communities. Expert teams will plan to expand lab capacity for testing, plan quarantine operations, coordinate communication and distribute, guide and distribute guidance across government, respond to the needs of our local boards of health, monitor supply chains, and identify surge capacity in our healthcare network. On a final note, I want to remind everyone that in addition to the role we all have to play in pushing back against this virus, there are other things we can do. Call your neighbors, your friends, and your families. A friendly check-in can go a long way right now to helping someone through their day. And as a final reminder, you can always visit mass.gov slash COVID-19 or call 211 for the latest information. And visit mass.gov slash no plan prepare for helpful advice on planning for emergencies. With that, I want to turn the podium over to Secretary Mary Lou Sutters. Good evening. As you know, on March 10th, governor, the governor declared a state of emergency in the Commonwealth to respond to the spread of COVID-19. Under that authority today, five new public health orders are issued. The first order immediately expands access to telehealth while we mitigate risk during the COVID-19 outbreak. The order requires all commercial insurers and the Group Insurance Commission to cover medically necessary telehealth services in the same manner and to pay the same rate as in-person services. Additionally, the order prohibits cost sharing and prior authorization for telehealth services for the treatment of COVID-19. Telemedicine is one of the most important things we need to divert care from hospitals and ambulatory sites for patients. By enabling patients to remain at home, rapid treatment delivery can be provided. We can adhere to social distancing protocols. We can optimize efficiency and conserve resources. The second order is that all assisted living facilities, nursing facilities, and rest homes are to ban visitors to protect the health of residents and staff. And obviously there's exceptions for end of life and hospice care. This is consistent with federal guidelines issued on Friday by CMS that bans visitors to nursing homes. The third order requires that all hospitals that are operated by or licensed by the Department of Public Health and or the Department of Mental Health must screen all visitors and may restrict visitation or limit the number of visitors. A fourth ban is that beginning Wednesday, hospitals and licensed ambulatory surgical centers must cancel non-essential elective procedures in accordance with DPH guidance which will be published either late today or tomorrow. This is to ensure that medical supplies and resources are available for treatment of individuals with COVID-19 should they require medical attention or hospitalization. It also further conserves personal protective equipment such as masks, gowns, and gloves for youth by healthcare professionals. And the fifth order allows certain pharmacists to make hand sanitizer to address the shortage of hand sanitizer in the Commonwealth. I just want to remind residents of the Commonwealth, if you have questions, to please call 211. More than 1,600 calls have now been made since it went live. Standing up this line has greatly reduced non-urgent calls to the state's epi line, clearing that line for clinical consultations. 
And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Commissioner Burrell. Thank you, Secretary. Good evening. I'd like to now share with you our latest COVID-19 case counts and some other data related to testing of COVID-19 in Massachusetts. Today, we announced a total of 164 cases in our state. That is up from 138 yesterday. We are going to see more cases in Massachusetts. Our goal now is to decrease the impact of COVID-19 in the Commonwealth. As we announced earlier today, 799 patients have been tested by our Massachusetts State Public Health Laboratory, up from 475 people tested yesterday. With the new system we have put in place with federal approvals, we will be doing more testing on more people, which has been our goal from the start. With the new CDC guidance on clinical testing protocols, clinicians are required to only submit one nasal swab, rather than the previous requirement to submit both nasal and throat swabs. With this change in clinical testing protocol, the state lab's testing capacity will inque increase to approximately 400 patients a day, up from the current 200 patients a day. With national labs now being approved by the FDA to conduct testing, clinicians can submit specimens for testing directly to these labs. We are now seeing these labs come online and begin to report results. As of today, we have been notified of seven new cases identified by testing through these labs. We are also beginning to see hospitals being able to test, and this is good news. With more clinical labs in Massachusetts working to get FDA approval, even more capacity will be coming online soon. And we have received at least 170 specimen results from these labs, bringing our total tested to at least 969. To speed the testing process for all of these facilities, Massachusetts clinicians now have more flexibility to determine which patients should be tested without having to call our Department of Public Health epidemiology line. All of these changes will enable more people to be tested and for more tests to be conducted. We had previously informed you about community level transmission of unknown origin in Berkshire County. Today's data suggest community level transmission of unknown origin in seven counties in Massachusetts. These include Berkshire, Essex, Hamden, Norfolk, Middlesex, Suffolk, and Worcester. As you have heard, this is an evolving situation. I speak to you as a physician your Commissioner of Public Health, and as a member of my own community. Please take seriously the social distancing measures that you heard the Governor speak about. Social dist distancing is our collective opportunity to influence the course of this illness and flatten the curve. Each of us needs to do our part. We help our neighbors and our friends and our families when we do our part. Let's take care of each other and we will get through this together.